Have a seat. Before I get started this morning, uh, I just want to thank Janice. Her sermon last week was exceptional. It was just one of the best words that I think I've ever heard on that subject. It was just a great job. So thank you, Janice, for having done that for us. And grateful, grateful for a deep preaching team. So the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What would the church look like if this was the testimony of every Christian? If this was the missional heart of every Christian? You see, it's easy to read a passage like Galatians 2 on Sunday morning in an air-conditioned room. It's a whole nother deal to leave it out, live it out every day when we're apart from this building. As we come to the end of our series with one of the most polarizing claims in all of Christendom. It's the statement that there is only one way to the Father, and that is to go through Jesus Christ. The thing is, nobody really wants to believe this, and yet denial of this biblical truth might cost you heaven. And worse yet, it has a ripple effect that could cost your children and your grandchildren their salvation. The fact is, is that most, most people, both inside and outside of Christendom, live and act as if they don't really believe this truth. We think eventually everyone goes to heaven. Good people go to heaven, nice people go to heaven, and for sure generous people go to heaven, right? Surely there, surely there must be many roads to the Father, is what we believe. There are people who say things to me like, Padre, will you put a good word in with me with the big guy in the sky? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Padre, really? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a crazy testimony to the fact that we believe that we can crowd surf on the wake of someone else's faith into heaven, that somebody, that I, of all people, would have enough influence to carry some of you into heaven just because I put a good word in for you. It's ludicrous at its greatest form. The fact is that most people have not taken their life on earth or their salvation very seriously. The fact is, is in our current age of pluralism, it seems exclusionary and judgmental that someone could be left out. Who does God think he is to tell us who gets to go and doesn't go? Only in America could we create a God in our image and then be shocked when God will not act on our terms. This is the very definition of spiritual entitlements. Paul says in Romans 1.25, he says, they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and have worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. I think this could have been written to the church today as easily it was as it was 2,000 years ago. I see people trading the truth for lies all the time. Young people, old people, rich people, poor people. The lie is just more appealing in our culture today. But here's the deal. To deny that there is only one way to the Father makes Jesus' virgin birth, life, death, resurrection inconsequential. It makes him completely unnecessary. Listen, I I get it. It would just be so much easier if we could just bypass Jesus and the whole repentance, obedience, dependence, surrender thing and just live how we wanted to live and still get heaven at the end. I get it, man. It'd be easier. It would be easier if everyone just got to go and we wouldn't feel any sense of responsibility to share our faith or have what we say line up with how we live. It would for sure make my life easier. Then we could could just do feel-good sermons on Sunday morning. We could just talk about how wonderful you are and how loving God is and how it is. And I wouldn't get bad emails and nobody would be mad at me and everybody would be happy. It would be easier for me if everybody just got to go. Sadly, we live in an age that believes that there are many ways to the Father and that heaven doesn't have a gate, much less a gatekeeper named Jesus. There are many people who simply think that hell is an overreaction to sin. But what if any offense, any sin, any dishonor against an infinitely worthy, an infinitely valuable, an infinitely dignified, an infinitely beautiful being as God is, then how can infinite sin demand anything other than infinite punishment? Jesus is looking pretty good about now, right? He's looking better by the moment. One of the things that I've been studying lately, I I, I taught it in Vineyard a couple weeks ago, is just the difference between a gathering and a following. A gathering is an accumulation of people. Even the DMV can have a gathering. I mean, you can go to the DMV and find people gathering, right? But a following is intentional, it's directional, it's sacrificial. 
It's interesting to me is that I study scripture that Jesus had huge gatherings. Sermon on the Mounts, the worship service at Peter's house, the feeding of the 5,000, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But as Jesus makes his way to the cross during Holy Week, the actual number of followers is about 200. On the day that Jesus is crucified, those who are left that would publicly claim him reaches single digits. So there must be a difference between those who are fully committed and those who just want something. Surely when Jesus said, we must take up our cross and follow him, this was more than a suggestion. This wasn't just some sort of ancient metaphor that he threw out there that we can loosely apply today just as we see fit. The myth of the North American church is that, that if I'm gathering, then I must be following. If I showed up on Sunday, then I must be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Cultural, the culture has melded these two into one. I think this is why Matthew 7 is dedicated to this entire issue. Jesus says we must ask, seek, and knock. He says that there is both a narrow and wide road in the kingdom, and they lead to different places. He says there are true and false prophets. He says there are wolves in sheep's clothing walking among us, so it matters who has your ear. He says that there are wise and foolish builders, and our foundations are dependent upon the materials we use. And finally, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father. And the will of the Father would be that you would follow Jesus Christ. Jesus makes it clear in a single chapter that there will be a judgment day, that gathering is not the same thing as following, and that what we believe about Jesus and who he is really, really matters. If you listened only to the voice of Jesus, read only the words that came out of his mouth, you would have a clear understanding of what it means to be a follower of him. However, if you listen to modern blog writers and, and prosperity gospel preachers, you can have a completely different understanding of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Could there be a more catastrophic problem in the faith communities of North America than this? There have been millions of men and women who have been taught that they can become a Christian and it will cost them nothing. And they believe this. There are those who have the audacity to teach that life will be problem free if you simply have enough faith. And Jesus taught, taught the exact opposite. I think we have dangerously blurred or confused our rights as Americans with what it means to submit to Jesus as Lord. You see, people are happy to have Jesus as Lord as long as it aligns with my dreams and, and my desires and my passions and all the things I want out of life. Listen, church, I believe life is too short, eternity too long, and hell too hot to fake church. There is a lot at stake, and it all depends on what you believe and what you believe about who opens the gates. In Acts chapter 4, Scripture makes it clear that salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind, which we must be saved. One of the great privileges and sacred trust for Janice and I is to walk with people through the death of a loved one. Can I tell you that when I meet with a family to plan someone's memorial service, when I sit with them, the only thing that is happening in my heart and my head is I want to hear them talk about how their loved one loved Jesus. I want to hear how Jesus was everything to them. I want to hear how Jesus was their hope and their security. And to the very end, they trusted him. This is what I want to hear. Because in that moment, I know that that's all that matters. Sadly, what we hear is a litany of hobbies that they believe their loved ones will carry into heaven. Well, I know that grandpa will be playing golf today in heaven and that'll be great. And, you know, he's probably sitting there with his dog, Rufus, who died. You know, I mean, we hear everything but... They love Jesus, as if seeing the face of God would not be good enough, that we believe we need something else to entertain us while we're in heaven, because after all, God will fall short somehow of being who we say he is. Somehow we've taken the holiness out of heaven. We have demystified the mysterious and made heaven like a lifetime past to Disney World. This is why I'm convinced that gatherers would hate heaven if they ever got to go. Because the truth is, they're always looking for something more than Jesus. Jesus is never enough for gatherers. They weren't enough in the first century, and they're not enough now. You know, people say strange things to me all the time about this subject. It really reflects a biblical illiteracy in our country, because we have no idea what God says about all this. The number one argument has always been, good people go to heaven, that a loving God would not send anybody to hell. 
right? We have no theology of hell in the Methodist Church. I'm just telling you right now, Methodist Church possesses no theology of hell. It's just crazy to me. At first glance, at first glance, this theory seems all fair. By fair, I mean people who do good deserve good things. I mean, if you do well in the tryouts, you make the team. If you do well in school, you get to go to the next grade. If you do well at your job, you receive raises and promotions. If you're a 20-something guy and you can brush your teeth every day, not be sleeping on your mother's couch, and use deodorant on a regular basis, you might get a wife. I'm just telling you, there's promotion all the time, right? Being rewarded for our efforts is part of the human experience and expectation. So it makes sense to us that it originated in God. Somewhere along the way, we connected being good here to getting to go there. But let's be honest, if there is a life beyond this one, and where we end up is determined by our test score, then we're going to have to know what the score is to be needed, right? You're going to have to know how many points to get. Most of our young people have just finished finals, I know, because they've asked me to pray for them. Um, Every year, when my boys were in school every year, all the way through college, they could tell you to the exact point the score they needed on their final to still get an A. It befuddled me that they put so much time and energy into calculating the exact score they needed to still get an A, as if they were going to go, I'm going to study uh, right to there. I, I'm not so sure we don't do that in the church. I mean, I mean, think about this, right? So is heaven like this? Is God keeping score of our good deeds? Does God score on a curve? What if we run out of time? Does he only answer the, and score the questions we answer? I mean, is he taking attendance on Sunday? I mean, it begs the question, how good is good enough? What's the score? What's the score that I need? What do you need? And is the score different than it is for me, Jerry? I think Jerry's going to need more points than me. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, I don't know. I mean, just could it be? I mean, I don't know. The, the other day, the other day I was at a fundraising luncheon, which I have been a lot at this year. I've been at more fundraising luncheons than it meant. And it weirds people out to find out that I'm a pastor. It just is like, you can just see the, the enjoyment of the day leaves the table. You know, they're like, <laughs> like seriously, I gotta sit at the table with the pastor and it just brings awkward out in people. And so, <laughs> I wasn't gonna tell the story, but I'm to tell the story really quick before I get to the main story. So I, I did something for, for the uh, Children's Hunger Project here in Brevard. I, I did the invocation and I, so I did this powerful metaphor. I said, can you imagine that if you're gonna go to the buffet line and you go through the line, and you lift the first chafing diff, and it's empty. You lift the, lift the second chafing diff, and it's empty. You lift the third chafing diff, and it's empty. And you're standing there with an empty plate after you were promised that you would be fed at this luncheon. And you have to come back and sit at your table, and you don't get to eat. I said, that's what hundreds of children in Brevard County face every day. And then I went and sat down. And the, the person across the table from me goes, are you not eating? And I go, how could I eat after the metaphor I just used? <laughs> Right? So I'm at this luncheon, different luncheon, and during the course of a conversation with a woman next to me, uh, and, and she says, just completely unsolicited after she finds out I'm a pastor, she says, you know, if I died today, I'm confident that I would go to heaven. So I just couldn't help myself. I said, really? Why, why is that? Because I keep the Ten Commandments, she says. And that kind of struck me strange, because I've never heard anybody say that their, their salvation was based on the Ten Commandments, right? And so I said, uh, uh, so... So how many of them do you know? How many of them do you keep? She said, well, I know most of all of them. I said, well, so which ones are you keeping right now? And literally, you can't make this stuff up. She says, I've not killed anyone yet. <laughs> and I was struck by the word yet, like it was still an option. Like it was like, you know, that could still be out there. And I thought, man, her poor husband, right? Right, so, and she says, then, then she saved that. She says, and I've never cheated on my husband. And I'm thinking, wow, she's two for 10. <laughs> you know, you couldn't even be a minor league baseball player at two for 10, right? Again, again, because I can't help myself, you know, I just like to poke the bear. I, I said, do you know in the Bible where the Ten Commandments are? She looks at me kind of, says, again, you can't make this up. She said, nope, but I sure as hell don't break any of them. <laughs> Conversation over. <laughs> the fact is, is there are more than Ten Commandments in the Bible. In fact, there are hundreds of them, and most of us, myself included, don't obey them. My point is, if you're looking for a God who lets good people go to heaven, then whatever you do, don't read the New Testament. And by all means, you should avoid the teachings of Jesus. The fact is, is that there is nothing about salvation that's based on fairness, good deeds, or even behavior modification. It's based on transformation through the adopting of the heart and the life 
of Jesus Christ. Listen, the reason that good people don't go to heaven is because there aren't any good people. There aren't any good people. There are only sinners. But thankfully, Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I tell people all the time, listen, you do not want God to use a fairness system. A truly fair God would give everyone what they deserve and nothing more. And the Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and all have fallen short of God. What we deserved was death. Fairness died on the cross that day so that the playing field could be leveled for all people. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Don't miss this. In our politically correct age, in our attempts to be sensitive, we often misplace the truth about sin and death. And when we do this, we no longer are helping people. We're damning them. We're giving them a false sense of hope. We're giving them a false sense of divine security. What some do in the name of being open-minded and compassionate is actually done out of cowardice. By contrast, Jesus loved people enough that he was willing to suffer a lifetime of rejection in order to make sure that people got the truth. And you know by now, if you've been here with me very long, you ought to know by now that I am more interested in us getting this Jesus thing right than using cheap grace to fill seats. Right? We're going to preach the truth, and it's going to land where it needs to land, and then we're going to journey together. So let's journey together. Go to John chapter 14. Let's look at a passage of hope. Jesus gathering with the disciples. His time is coming near to an end. You can feel some anxiety, I think. And he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the place, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Our future is secure, Jesus says. In verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I and the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. This is quite a statement Jesus makes, isn't it? How could Jesus be the only way? Well, because he is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, because sin is an affront to God who created us, And it must be paid for us. And Jesus, without hesitation, stepped up and paid our debt, paid your debt, paid my debt, and then sets us free from bondage. And in one selfless act, Jesus restores our relationship with the Father so that we can be sons and daughters of God, so that we can be heirs in the kingdom. This passage is a statement of assurance. More than any other time in our life, I think this is a season where we need assurance. Assurance that life is more than this cultural and consumer chaos that surrounds us. Assurance that God has the last word and say over darkness, disease, and despair. Assurance that we can be loved unconditionally and that we are never truly alone when we have God. What we gather to celebrate every week turns out to be the most polarizing event in human history, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, this singular event does not allow for a neutral position. It forces everyone to choose what they believe. You either believe that Jesus is the Son of God sent to redeem the humanity from sin and death, or you think this life is all you get once around the planet and you're done. In John chapter 10, Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd, and he tells us that there is one gate and one gatekeeper. Again, you don't have to like this, but it doesn't make it any less true. Jesus is the gate. To get to the Father and the life he wants for you and I, we are going to have to enter through him. There is no shortcut. There is no going around. You can't go under. You can't deceive the gatekeeper to get in. And this passage reminds us that there is only one true shepherd, and everyone else is a thief sent to mislead or destroy us. And all of us would agree that there are, the world is full of plenty of people whose sole objective is our destruction. Jesus says, I am the gate, and all, co- all must come and go through me to find life. It's a foreshadowing of the cross. We live in a world that is, has a way of amplifying our pain. So many people spend time wondering if the loss can be found, if all this pain will ever go away, if our life will ever change at all. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in all things. All things are possible through me. 
What we've been saying for every Sunday of this year is that for people who believe in Jesus, these words are comforting and assuring amidst life's uncertainty. God sent his son to show us the way, to model the truth so that we would recognize the lies of this world, so that we, would might, so that we might have life to the fullest, so that our death sentence would be revoked. Now, for people who do not believe in Jesus, these words are hard. They're hard because they, they want salvation on their terms. And there are some who simply do not like boundaries and restrictions. And ultimately, these statements seem so exclusionary. It makes it sound hard to get in. So they buy into the lies of this world and the accommodations that they desire in order for them to have it their way. This is why surrendering to selfishness is the last and final battle before anyone is saved. You see, there are lots of ways to Jesus, but Jesus is the only way to, the God, to God. And what separates Jesus from every other religion is that there is no road that he will not travel to find you. No other religion on earth has a pursuing God. None. Not Islam, not Buddhism, not Hinduism, not the Jehovah Witnesses. Nobody has a pursuing God that will chase you down recklessly because he loves you. The truth is, the truth is, it is not hard to get in. It's just hard to give up our ways of doing things and submit to the Jesus way of doing things. The arrival of Jesus on earth signals to humanity a solution for sin is being sent. Separation is about to end. Hope is no longer coming. It has arrived. In Luke chapter 2, it says the angels declare to the shepherds that they do not need to be afraid anymore, that they bring new, great, good news of great joy for all people. Not some people, not just Jews, not just shepherds, but all people. In John 3, 16, it declares that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Everyone knows this verse, but do you know the verse that comes after that, which says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There would be no condemna condemnation in Christ, only a choice. In Luke 9, 23, it says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Anyone means anyone. Anyone means you. Anyone means me. Anyone means everyone. Anyone is an ultimate statement of inclusivity. God could not be more inclusive. This is the good news of the Gospels. God wants to redeem everyone. God wants none to perish. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a room for us. Why would we not make a reservation? But you can't get there without Jesus. You can't get into that room without Jesus. The truth is, when we look at the Gospels, Jesus is utterly unique. Everyone who had an encounter with him left different than they were when they met him. Some were healed, some were filled with hope, some were restored, but everybody was different. The fact is, is Jesus had an utterly unique relationship with God. If you go through the Old Testament, you'll find people like Abraham and Jacob and Moses and Esther and Elijah and Jonah, who all had extraordinary encounters with God. But nowhere in the Old Testament do you see anybody who had the confidence and familiarity and intimacy with God like Jesus. Jesus is the first person to actually call God this real tender Aramaic word, Abba, which means Father. Old Testament scholars would tell you that nowhere in the extensive prayer history of Judaism does anyone use Abba to describe God. No one does it before Jesus. Jesus has a unique ministry. Now, other people also had ministries for sure, but Jesus said, I have come so that you might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for sheep. Nobody said anything else like this. Nobody gives up what is rightfully theirs in order for someone else to have it, and yet Jesus did. And Jesus performed miracles and healed people in unique and different ways. There wasn't just one formula. There wasn't just one party trick. He spit in his hand. He made mud some days. He touched people. He spoke it. He did it. He was unpredictable. He knew things about people's lives. And he felt when someone touched his cloak and he sensed things before they happened. No one had seen anything like him before. Jesus said that the kingdom of God was now at hand and available on earth simply because he had arrived. And that heaven had come to earth. And nobody, nobody had said stuff like this. The book of Hebrews said that he was tempted in every way, just like you and I, yet he was without sin, unlike you and I. He never sinned. This is pretty amazing, right? Here's what I want you to do. Go ahead. Try not sinning for a day, just a day. Just try to go your whole day without sinning. 
Don't be selfish, don't slander, don't covet or envy. I would like to assume murder is off the table, but you try those other things and see how it goes. Just try that for one day. Just, it's like, I mean, like, like it's not sinning's no big deal, right? You can just do this for a day. But Jesus didn't do it for one day. He did it every day for an entire life. No sin. Who does this? Jesus died a unique death. Paul tells us what we, he received, he passed on to us as first importance, that Christ died for our sins. Everybody dies, but Christ died for us and our sins. He is the only one that has ever done that. And then he uniquely refused to stay dead. you got to love that about Jesus. He just was like, I ain't staying dead. He refused to stay dead. Paul says he was raised on the third day and appeared to the disciples in hundreds. And no one in that day refuted it. No one could explain it, but no one challenged it. No historian, Jew, or Greek ever tried to explain or deny the empty tomb. It was a mystery to everyone except those who believed. Except those who believed. People have looked at the life of Jesus and they asked themselves, how many other human beings in the history of humanity did all this? Claimed intimate knowledge of the Father. Claimed to have brought the kingdom of heaven to earth in person. Claimed to have been present at creation. Never sinned a single time. Healed people and brought them back from the dead. Died for the sins of the whole world. For both those who have died and those who have yet to be born. And then was raised from the dead. And then in the gifting of the Holy Spirit launches a worldwide movement in his name. That caused people to give up their life willingly and surrender their selfish ways in order to serve others. Pretty much just one man did this. This man, Jesus Christ. Throughout history, people were drawn to one staggering conclusion. Jesus was the son of God. That this Jesus was the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. People have believed this for centuries. Smart people, simple people, religious people, people who had never heard of Jesus. They all believed by faith that this was the son of God. Why, why, why? Would we ever for a second doubt that there is only one way to the Father? Why would we do that? Paul says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. This is the drum that I have been beating for the last four months, that we live in a place that will tempt you to believe that only the the only life that you have is this one that is bound by circumstances, bound by uncertainty, bound by earthly limitations, but these are lies. In fact, this is the kind of life that is driven by fear and not faith, and it's a great barrier to really living. In Jesus, there is so much more. This is why Jesus can boldly say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say his life was the way of consumerism and chaos and narcissism, come follow me. Jesus knows it was this kind of life and this kind of thinking that got him sent to earth in the first place. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. There is resurrection power that is available to all of us if we will believe in Jesus. Luis, you can come, buddy. I've come to the conclusion that following Jesus is the best way of life. I don't want any other life. I want to be found following Jesus, the only way to the Father. And if I hope to see the Father's face one day and enjoy eternity with him and hear those words, job well done, good and faithful servant, then I need to be ready to proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he is the only way. And church, it could not be better than this. Under this system, everybody is welcome. Everybody gets in the same way. Everybody can meet the requirements, but make no mistake about it. The way, the truth, and the life is a narrow road. In the age of pluralism, where everything is accepted and everything is allowed, you're going to have to swim against the flow of cultural pluralism and pressure to believe this. But the fact of the matter is is that truth, truth has always been narrow. Mathematical truth is narrow. Two plus two equals four. Four doesn't equal five it doesn't equal three scientific truth is narrow water freezes at 32 degrees fahrenheit not 34 or 35 geographical truth is narrow deserts are dry and mountains are tall 
It's, it's a fact that the earth sits most perfectly placed, that it, if it were 15 miles closer to the sun, we'd all burn to death. If it was 15 miles further away, we would all freeze to death. This is a geographical truth. It's a historical truth is narrow. Contrary to what some of you in the room believe, the South actually did lose the Civil War. <laughs> it's actually true historically that hundreds of thousands of veterans have given their life for our nation's freedom and mostly go ignored today. That's a historical truth. Why are we surprised that theological truth is narrow? Listen, there is but one way to come to the Father, and that is through the Son. And at that name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus has gone ahead to make a place for us, and his love has paved a way for us to live with assurance that he is the only way, that he is the complete and only truth, that he is the life that has been extended to us. So what is it that you really believe? What is it you really believe? Because at the end of the day, it's the only thing that matters. If you don't have Jesus, the room Jesus prepared for you in his father's house will go empty because it was made just for you. Someone else will not fill it. It'll just sit empty and it will make the father sad because he knew what he gave up in order for you to have that room. But make no mistake about it, Jesus comes so that one day, that Jesus can bring all his children home. That Jesus can take the Father's children and welcome them home. I'm just saying today that you're not going to want to miss that. You're not going to want to miss that. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be amazing on that day. I just learned in my own life, until, until until Jesus is enough, until Jesus is enough, Nothing else ever will. The calling is to preach Jesus until the whole world hears or until I go to heaven, whichever comes first. So I'm not going to back up from that. I also do not believe that the church is some sort of holy club, right? It's about membership, about gatherings. I believe it is about following and that Jesus knows whether we're following or not. And that that's I don't judge who gets to go to heaven. I know I will be judged based on preaching the truth. It's a difference, right? Right? I'll be judged based on whether you know the truth as the under-shepherd of the great shepherd. I want us all to get to go. Not, not because there's some sort of record that we're trying to achieve or that there's some sort of extra prize I get if I get the most people in heaven. I want us all to go because it's heaven. It's God. It's majesty. It's honor. It's incredible. Man, I pray, I pray that we take our faith and our salvation seriously, right? So that we can all one day be together again in heaven, right? And all of God's children said, I love you, church. Have a great week.